agricultural scientist and lecturer at CSU. Alison completed a PhD in native grassland ecophysiology before turning her attention to teaching and researching pasture management, agricultural systems and extension, workplace learning and curriculum design. In addition to her Holbrook Landcare Network, Alison manages a commercial fine wool merino enterprise and is mother to two girls. And she's going to tell, talk to us about her experience with our Farming Smarter project. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for having us along. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be wearing my landholder hat to, uh, for this talk this morning. Um, we, my husband and I have been farming since about 2012. We started with a lease block up at Yass. Um, I'm a sixth generation wool producer, so Yass is a good place to start when, you, when you've got that sort of background. And then we, we ended up purchasing a block, uh, blocks at Mangapla, and we're self-starters. So we're working from a pretty low resource base and building our farm as we go whilst working full time my partner and I in, in different areas. Um, so we got the opportunity to be involved with the Farming Smarter program um, a number of years ago, and that program is just at, to, at the end now. And uh, it, it was run by Riverina LLS, and it was designed to improve, uh, or address soil acidity and improve and work to improve um, pastures across the region. And uh, so um, we decided to participate in this program on our newest block that we purchased in 2019, which was Turkey Flat. And there's a picture of it there. Um, all I'm going to talk about today is why we participated and how the property plan report that was produced, and I'll go into some details of what the program looked like, um, what we sowed, was it a success, and, and how it all went, went, and what we learnt, which was a lot. Um, so yeah, we bought this block in 2019, it was really run down. Um, it had a previous history of continuous cropping and not well. There wasn't enough rotation of chemicals or, or crops or anything like that and um, was very flogged in that process uh, and it was followed by just a, about five years of lease where the, you know, um, where the cattle were run and, uh, you know, what lease land's like. It's never looked after either. So when we got it, it was in a pretty poor state. And um, we discovered pretty early on that we had severe annual ryegrass resistance. Uh, and we knew that we had a big problem because our core species when we turned up was sorrel. <laughs> Uh, silver grass and some, we had some patches of red grass, but that was about the only perennial on the place and a hell of a lot of hairy panic. So you can, you can imagine the type of block, just the sort self-starters want to buy the stuff that no one else wants. Um, so that's why we, uh, why we got it, uh, but it had potential. And so then we started the process of trying to turn it around and, and the Farming Smarter project came on at the right time because it was, it was about trying to get us to help, you know, trying to achieve the same sort of things we wanted to do. Um, we knew that our main production limitation on this block was feed base. And so the first task we had before all the fencing, before everything else, was to really start that pasture improvement program. Um, and the Farming Smarter program came in with the assistance of soil testing. That was the first phase. Then they would give us a report on that. And then we worked with the local land services agronomist. Uh, there was a webinar as well to help us understand those soil tests and to set out a plan for how we wanted to address it. The next part was we went into some cropping cleanup phases and we then sowed down to perennial pastures. Um, so we were going to do this. This program helped fast track that process. And the Farming Smarter program came in with incentives on the soil testing end, but also a little bit of subsidisation on the pasture, end, uh, pasture seed end, which was really helpful as well. So um, Precision Ag came in and they grid sampled the whole the 50 acres, the, the main paddocks that we wanted to do at the time, uh, down to 20 centimetres in two depths, so 0 to 10, 10 to 20. 
and um, we were really wanting to know um, how acid those soils were, how, how severe was the acidity which we could tell was there because of the species present, and to what depth was that and how much lime did it did we uh, need to apply to be able to fix this, these soils and, and get on with some successful perennial pastures. And so you can see that a bit of a soil analysis there on the left, and it's too small to read, but the red part, the red line, is showing that we had, um, is the pH, and you can see it's severe. And obviously, being a grid sampled, we had more detail than just an average there. Um, so, if we look at the next graph, this is showing the pH results across the paddock after the grid sampling. Um, Not to 10 there, it's a bit blurry, I'm sorry, but the red, uh, we'll start with the orange. The orange is the best. We had 5.2 and 4.9 in two patches, and then we, we dropped it down to 4.4, 4.3 in the red on the, on the um, in the red patches there. At 10 to 20 centimetres, uh, the, the red again is around that 4, 4.2, 4.3, and then the brown is down to four. Um, I don't think we dropped below four, but it was close. So some pretty severe problems. And one thing that is curious to me is these maps don't show any, you know, um, the maps are very different in terms of which areas are most acid. I haven't quite um, come to terms with why that is on this. So once we had the soil pH, the next phase was they actually gave recommendations on how, to, to, how much lime to apply. And we had a they, there was two targets set, 5.2 or 5.8. And if you look at these next graphs, just look at the colours, don't worry about the numbers too much on this because they're too small. But um, the, at 5.2, um, if we just wanted to do the 0 to 10, uh, it was going to have to be up to, you know, that, that's the variable ma rate mapping for it. Um, it. There was a couple of tonnes of, of um, lime to apply. If we wanted to do all the way to 20 centimetres, you can see the colours change pretty um, seriously. And in the browns, we're looking up to 7.2 tonnes there. So you can see that there was quite high rates suggested. If we look at the 5.8 here, the top amount to apply was 11 tonnes, um, which is kind of huge. So <laughs> We, know, we knew that the, the ideal target was 5.8 because we want that pH, we want that lime to move. Fortunately, just after the soil sampling, my husband had gone through and put a five, two and a half tonnes of lime on across the whole farm anyway because we knew we were going to have to do something. And so that helped break up what we were doing into a couple of applications. But we decided that whilst we wanted to aim for 5.8, 5.2 was a little bit more realistic. So the top amount we put on was about that four, four and a half, five tonnes. Um, that's my husband's gear. Fortunately, we've got um, reasonably good equipment to be able to do that, that prescri prescription applications um, and all that sort of stuff. So that part was easy at least. Um, when we had the discussions with the agronomist, Lisa Castleman, it was, we, we were discussing the options of incorporation. We ended up not going with it because we didn't have quite the right equipment to be able to incorporate at that point, but also topography didn't really give us a, you know, a good option in the paddocks that we're in. So the only incorporation we had was time disturbance at sowing, <laughs> so that not really at all. Um, so the main mix that we were going for, we're about a 600 mil rainfall. Um, so we wanted perennials, obviously, in there. It had to be perennials according to the, the, the grant, which was fine by me. We wanted to get a range of subclover uh, maturity lengths in there. And we had hilltops and flats in the same paddock. And so the way I designed it was that we had coxfoots in there, which are 
thought would do better on the gravelly hilltops, and then we had Phalaris in there, which we thought would do better at the low areas, and Balancer Clover also to help us with the, to get production out of those lower areas as well. Um, before sowing, though, we did try and get in as much um, winter clean uh, cereal crop uh, as we could, or cropping as we could to get that cleaning because of the annual ryegrass resistance. Uh, and because we also knew it was just going to be a massive challenge in terms of getting a successful establishment. This is a bit of an agri-web map of our farm. The paddocks we were aiming to do were, and the one that we started with first was the, the two yellow ones, um, TT at the front there, 18 hectares. It was what we call triangle paddock. Um, we managed to get a canola in that. It was probably had the least ryegrass in it, so we, we, we went in with a canola, did a clean up as much as we could, and then we went in with a pasture mix there, and I'll show you some images of that later on. Uh, TH, which stands for Trig Hill, we had a few goes with crops first on that one. Um, we put triticale and canola in there. This is post um, liming. And then we, we went in with a pasture mix this year. Um, we were also going to be doing, we started off planning to do the CYP paddock, which stands for Cattle Yards Paddock, uh, with putting a canola in there. Uh, and then we, for various reasons, switched to doing the, the pine paddock, which we, we're planning, it's still got to be sown this autumn. So I'll show you some I images of We'll focus on the yellow paddocks here because they're the ones that have been done because we're still in process, progress, I guess. The, the interesting thing was because we had such high um, liming rates um, due to the timing of the program um, and the lack of incorporation, we, we made the stratification in that soil worse, I think. We had... Um, we had J roots appearing, there was other things happening, and um, we didn't have the success in our crops as, as much as we would have liked in those years. They were really tough years for establishment in our area, um, really, really wet as well, so um, that caused us a lot of issues. We also suspect there might have been other things going along with this. Um, we think that there may have been trace element issues pop up because of the, the high liming rate and the change in availability of those micronutrients at the time. Um, and I think because of the history of this block too, the more I talk about it, the more I think, well, you know, we had a long period of just annuals and, and cropping in that same area. So we had a subsurface, subsoil issue that we, constraints that we were dealing with, which were also causing challenges. Um, so that dumping of that amount of lime in a short period, um, I think, was, was, was a definite issue. And you can see in the top photo the yellowing on the margins of the canola there and the patchiness of it was a bit of a challenge, let's just say. Uh, in the other paddock, in the triangle paddock, we also had some challenges there. Simply, um, we didn't have the annual ryegrass issues that we had in the other paddock, uh, which was good but it was just seasonal issues that we had to deal with. And I think, again, because of that long annual grass history, you know, we had a lot of seeps for about four months where we just couldn't get on to do control. And so we did have to have a bit of a battle with slugs. And you can see towards the bottom of that hill where those trees are, there's some patchiness that has occurred because of that. So, yeah, it was seasonal issues in the other paddock which probably caused our biggest stresses. Having said that, though, this is what it looked like in January this year. So this is that triangle paddock. And you can see that already it's had a big impact on the length of growing season. On the right-hand side is the actual paddock, and that is mostly coxfoot that you can see there. It's just gone brilliantly. Um, on the left-hand side over the fence is an annual pasture that we haven't actually done anything with yet. And you can just see the contrast there in production potential that's been shifted already. Um, so that, so the LLS funding definitely helped in, in terms of pushing us to get this done and already it's having a, an impact on our productive capacity. My wiener's loving it at the moment. Um, 
and it definitely enabled more soil testing than we would have done otherwise. Um, the, LA, the, the project also helped us, you know, get that pasture improvement, improvement going sooner and it was great to have that backup of the agronomists as we're making our decisions on this as well. And I think from my husband's point of view, having someone hand him maps that he could just then go ahead and do was, was, was really good as well. There was no, it was just roll it out. And it helped us commit to keeping getting it done because the seasonal conditions we had was a challenge and it would have been very easy to have an empty paddock for a year. So despite the challenges, this is what the pasture looked like just last week. So you can see the density of the, the coxfoot there. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how whether the phalaris becomes a bit more dominant, particularly down the bottom of the hill over the coming years. We're definitely on the way to getting at least 65% perennial pasture over the next four years. We would be higher, except we, we're going to be cropping a couple of the bigger paddocks out the back. Um, we've learnt a lot, particularly about getting the soil right and how we might do go about that incorporation um, and, and those applications in the future. Um, I don't think we'll bulk it quite the way we did in the past. And it's definitely given my husband an excuse to get some new machinery. So that's the new speed tiller he's bought just for the job. So nice another bill. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of challenges. Um, you know, we've upgraded our cedar. Unfortunately, we were going straight into a wet year, so I had to put a bog feature because, my God, we had some bogs. Um, but um, our paddock preparation is definitely getting better. And um, because of this um, investment, and um, we just have to recognise that sometimes the season is against you. And I think that's the hardest thing with trying to do pastures projects is it's it's tricky. Trying to get that timing right to be able to get it done within the program timelines was probably the biggest challenge of all. So finally, thanks to Riverina LLS and Lisa Carsman was the, the key one that rolled this program out and also the federal government, I guess, for, and the National Land Care Program for supporting this. A um, bit of a shout out to, to the husband who had to put up with getting the tractor bogged at all sorts of hours and all the rest of it as well to get it done. But that's the result, so we're pretty happy with that and I'm looking forward to the next paddock getting up and going soon. Thank you. Thanks, Alison.